And to close out this episode, what I'd like to do is share some thoughts from an engineer, uh, an episode that we've done a few times over the years, essentially uh, just sharing my thoughts on the topic. Uh, it is, I'll, I'll share the some of the facts about it, and then I'll share my opinion in the hopes that it helps stir up a discussion that helps you engage and send us what you think about it, um, a, a show and tell as far as thoughts and ideas on a certain topic. We're living in the world with with war and calamity and chaos, and we're seeing space get involved in military conflicts more and more, although military conflicts in space are part of its uh, genesis with the space race and the V2 rocket before that that led up to this. So space is definitely not shy or not uh, separate from military operations and national defense. Most of the astronauts that have been up there have been servicemen and women. And now the private space company, SpaceX, has taken another dip into the space military with their new offering of Starlink. So Starlink, for those that are new to SpaceX's global satellite uh, network, this global satellite network is was created to provide internet around the world, especially to those remote areas where getting the fiber optic cables from land or from across the ocean were just not possible. So Starlink has already started to make some big waves around the world. Not only is it providing a service to people that haven't had it before, it's starting to get on planes, trains, and automobiles, cruise ships, very soon, T-Mobile may even be offering Starlink as part of the, what is their Magenta program or whatever there. Just, you know, I have T-Mobile as well. It was a nice surprise to find out that I may be able to have Starlink with the service I already have. <laughs> but essentially, it's becoming a commodity and something that's being used in a commercial sense. In this past year, Starlink has been deployed in natural disasters around the planet, and Lately, in this past year, it was also used in the fight on uh, in Ukraine with Russia and against Russia. The satellites have been used in a theater of war unlike they've ever been before. You know, the Starlink dishes were provided to the people of Ukraine. Uh, if you were following along on Twitter as this was happening, essentially the Starlink receivers were being tracked by Russian soldiers and they were being attacked. So people were being told to leave their Starlink dishes away from where they actually were and then get the internet to run cables so that they could they could be able to access it from a distance. Uh, Russia was also attempting to jam the satellites and SpaceX being a software company as well, making all of their stuff in-house, essentially. Uh, they have the ability to make adjustments on the fly and on the battlefield, Starlink has been a uh, kind of a, a very underrated advantage. And from a technology perspective, uh, it opens up a whole nother aspect to the point where now the Starlink is going to be created in a national defense variant called Starshield. Now, we said before that it sounds just like something out of a Marvel movie and it honestly is not too far off from that plot line. So if you go to SpaceX.com slash Starshield, you can see it's supporting national security, secured satellite network for government entities. Starshield leverages SpaceX's Starlink technology and launch capability to support national security efforts. While Starlink is designed for consumer and commercial use, Starshield is designed for government use with an initial focus on three areas. Earth observation, Starshield launches satellites with sensitive payloads and delivers processed data directly to the user. Communications, where Starlink provides assured global communications to government users with Starshield user equipment. And it also provides hosted payloads, where Starshield builds satellite buses to support the most demanding customer payload missions. So essentially, the Starlink satellite and that global network 
can now have a government entity version where they'll be able to provide the government with their own technology and security efforts from orbit. Now, there's a lot of things to get into here. I, myself, have to be very cautious, or, or, or my, hmm, how should I say this? With no disrespect, I have so much respect and admiration for the human beings that put their life on the line to defend the country. Uh, it's something that I, myself, didn't feel a calling to, but as I learn more and more from veterans who speak more and more about what they know of, Jocko Willink, Navy SEAL, and then there's also folks like David Goggins, who their stories and the other veterans that they speak to, uh, to hear their stories puts my life into so much perspective, and I have such an appreciation for what they've offered all of us, especially here in America. All of that said, it seems that in, in my own lifetime, that war is something that can be started very easily and is really hard to stop. So I approach this star shield idea with a bit of caution. I do realize that there's definitely a use for space in the domain of war. And I'm not naive enough to say that it's not like this whole thing that we have a podcast about is, hasn't been available because of that as well. But when we start talking about Earth observation and communications and hosted payloads, uh, I have more questions. So I definitely want to discuss more with folks that may understand this a little bit better. We may be speaking with the folks over at Embedded Ventures again to discuss global comms and, and what something like this means but also to chat more about what the industry already has. I mean, SpaceX wouldn't be getting into this business if there wasn't already a business available. And we've talked to a few people with different companies uh, and military applications, really, if, if we're talking about what has kept the space program alive as America figured out their human space travel initiative to get to the point where Artemis One has returned to Earth, it's the military applications that has kept that going. Now, obviously, we hope it's more than that, and it is at its core about venturing into space and exploring and finding out more about humanity, but also resources and all those other things. We can't just have a complete land grab out there where people are grabbing resources, and, and the more and more we get into the future here as SpaceX succeeds more and more, pushing the entire industry and the entire world towards a future where space becomes more affordable and thus more people can have access to it. Um, just like we have a an Air Force and a Navy and the Army, we have the Space Force now. And while, you know, originally it was very easy to joke about it, it is the Space Force that is involved in all these launches and was involved in uh, this last, you know, Hakuto R mission and the return. Like we said, the Navy was helping Artemis One come back. So uh, it's it's a complex subject. I honestly have a uh, a not so great feeling about it, um, but I also be honest that I don't know enough about it to know where is the line that should be crossed and what are other countries doing and. Is this just another step forward in trying to have global relations where, as we saw with the Space Force's early uh, review, we did an episode talking about the futures of space that the Space Force saw, the idea of the Star Shield it plays key into that mentality of allowing everybody to have the ability to launch into space and not have a future where one, space becomes so uninteresting that nobody launches except for a few military missions, but also where another country may decide to end space travel for all of us and uh, allow some type of Kessler effect where a bunch of satellites get destroyed 
as we've seen multiple payload de destruction demonstrations where we're now still categorizing debris from those explosions that all space operations are having to go around, right? So the the if we don't have any kind of guidance or people monitoring that stuff, uh, it could be it could get so bad that nobody has access to space. The question is is how close to the line of everyone has a sh has a chance at the final frontier. Like, how close are we to that? Is it is it just word service or is this actually something that's good for everybody? So uh, I, I'm asking really, what, what do you think? Is this something that you're concerned about? Do you think it's a great thing? Do you think it's a bad thing? Um, are you agnostic? Do you, do you not think it's a problem at all? Um, or does it not bother you in the slightest? I would love to know. Hit us up on social media. Email us at Today in Space Podcast. I'd love to know. We'd love to read your answers here on the podcast in the future. But I will definitely be looking for someone to talk to about this uh, so we can ask more questions and get their opinion on it and really chew on this because this is an example of how I feel the momentum uh, is shifting. Now, is, do I think ultimately it's good for long-term progress in space and making it so that we have that future that NASA is talking about where we have long sustained uh, human presence. It's something that uh, SpaceX is built upon. It's something that iSpace is built upon. Uh, do we need solid military presence in space in order for that future to exist? Uh, it seems like there, the obvious answer is yes, but uh, I am optimistically cautious at just saying a uh, blatant yes without questioning uh, where the, the line actually is. Uh, and so that's my thought for this week. I'd love to know what you think. Uh, and if you have anyone you think we should talk to about this, please let us know. 